everybody, and welcome to Let Me Introduce You. This is the first of a series, and I'm really excited that you're here. Delighted that you're here, um, in fact. And I'm Marion Roach Smith, and this is part of the Memoir Project. And as I said, it's the first in this series called it's called Let Me Introduce You. And look, I've got someone saying hello. Hi, Lisa. How are you? I'm so glad to see you. Um, you won't see me and you won't see Ross because Ross and I are just about zoomed out at this point. I'm assuming all of you are just as zoomed out as you are. Um, but Lisa tells me she can uh, hear us. And I'd love to know from the rest of you if you can see the screen that says from story to stand up. So just find that questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel and shoot me a little message like, yes, I can see it. Yep, you can see the screen. Thanks, Tricia. That's fabulous. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That's great. So all you have to do is sit back and relax. We're just going to have a little bit of fun. I don't know about you. I could use a little fun. So as I said, this is the first in this new series called Let Me Introduce You. And what I was thinking about a few weeks ago is that I meet these people all the time who tell stories in various ways. And I started to think that you, the very best memoir writers in the world, might like to meet them too. So that's what this is. This is just a, you meet them, they this, they meet you, and we hang out together for an hour once a month. So tonight's the first one in what I hope will be a monthly series. And so again, all you have to do is sit back and relax and let's hope the screen works. Look at that. So I'm Marion Roach Smith and I run the Memoir Project. And I think that the people that I'd like to introduce you to can best be defined by people who might help you further your careers. So we're going to do this series. It's going to be free. It's going to be fun. And well, why the hell not? So tonight, I'm going to introduce you to my friend, Ross Bennett. And so, hi, Ross. How are you? I'm fine. And by the way, this picture is the reason that you're not seeing us live. <laughs> That's uh, that. <laughs> That, that was taken when Marion actually asked me if I wanted to do this. <laughs> yeah, and that that is, I should just grab my phone and shot this, absolutely. Right. So um, Ross was kind enough after he got over the initial question to say yes. And so let's just talk about for a second who Ross is. He's been seen on over a dozen television shows, including Comedy Central's Tough Crowd with Colin Quinn and Amy's Evening at the Improv and Late Show with David Letterman. In 2019, Dry Bar Comedy released Ross's full-length special, Comedy for the Rest of Us, which has been viewed millions of times. He's a working stand-up comic, a coach, and a teacher of stand-up. So again, Ross, it's a joy to have you here. We've met only recently, but I've been to one of your shows, and I, uh, well, I laughed my ass off. So those, those are your qualifications, as far yeah, as I'm nice. concerned. The uh, uh... You came out and saw me at a club. Yep. And that's the big thing that uh, uh, what I bring to the table here for tonight is that I'm a working comic. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm not um, I'm not doing a one person show in a theater. I'm not you know doing storytelling. You know, I'm I'm actually engaged financially to make people laugh. <laughs> and Thank many, goodness. many people have many different ways that they do it. You know, you can think of people like. Um, uh, like Stephen Wright, who has these wonderful, wonderful uh, individual jokes that are just, you know, just, just, just so, um, so perfect and so funny, and they're so weird. Um, my stuff tends to come from the germ of what I do is um, um, things that happen in my life. Yep, and that's and, what I and that's, my personal story. Yeah. Right, and that's why I thought this would be great because memoir writers tell me all the time. Gee, like they, it's like they whisper to me, like they're telling me some big secret. Gee, I, I, I love to find a way to perform my story. Or, you know, I like this writing thing all kind of, but how about, do you know anything about performance? And I thought, oh, do I ever? Um, I, I, I know somebody who might be able to answer their question. So tonight we're going to talk about humor. We're going to learn the difference between storytelling and stand up. We're going to deconstruct a joke or two. And we're going to talk about how to curate your own life story for stand up. So, when I put this to you, you said, yeah, let's let's teach people what the difference between storytelling and stand-up is, and, and let's talk about jokes and how you be funny and what you can do with them. So let's just do exactly that. How about it? So memoir writers writing funny. This is a question that comes up all the time with my memoir writers. They say, you know what? I, I, I feel like my copy needs to be lighter or funnier. This is a tough subject. Or... Um, you know, how do I get some jokes in it? So we'll talk about that. 
But when I asked you this question, the first thing I asked you is what can they do with jokes? And you gave me two ideas about what they can do just right off the top of your head. Yeah, I mean, because we're talking about um, things that are meant to hit someone over the head like a baseball bat. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, this isn't just a, a, a witty little repartee that that people on the upper echelons of society are going to, oh, that's very, that's very, Twitter very, over. <laughs> very, very droll. You know, <laughs> we're talking about something where there's a bunch of people who are expecting things to make them laugh and then you hit them with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And my thought is, well, these kind of jokes, how can they be used? Right. And if you're a writer, my first thought was at the, at the top, at the, I always see those pages where at the top of the, of each chapter mm -hmm. is some sort of a joke. Right. You know, and it's it's extracted out of something that is probably happening in that chapter. Yep. And that's that's one thing that you can do with 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 jokes. Another one is interviewing. Mm -hmm. You know, like what we're doing right here. When you watch any, anybody on a talk show, anybody who's trying to sell something, and they're trying to you know use their personality to sell it, nothing engages an audience more than if you can say something that makes them laugh. Right. Okay, it, it it just draws them in, and and you're paying. It's a, there's a payoff going on with it. You aren't just sitting there being bored, right? By someone droning on, right? Okay. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. I know I do a podcast called Cordy, and I know that sometimes when we get laughing, I realize when I listen to the playback, I listen, I realize that it it lightened the material it gave us some joy it ex we experienced some group laughter it's a cathartic experience right so we all know that but it's also a communal experience it is also a communal okay experience. i mean if, if you're t if, if, what i do is a, in a group with a group of people you know 50 100 200 i just did a show with 1200 people and when they're all doing that at the same time there's something going on that you, you it hits them on a different level. Right. We could all use okay. it a lot. We, we really missed that in COVID, right? Right. We're, we're, we're all missing that experience. I'm missing live theater when, when anybody asks me what I'm missing most. It's right up there, right? Live theater, because that cathartic experience in a crowd. But with humor, it's different because we're all laughing at the same moments. Yeah. And, 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 that's, what, and that's what they're there for. That's what they're invested in from the very beginning. Right. Right. So let's talk about that. So let's we'll walk we'll walk through this a bit in terms of what memoir writers can do. But you told me this story, and I found this fascinating about Tom Hanks and his career a career changing moment for him. And um and yeah, there he's got you got the creak. I gave you the creakiest chair that's in okay. the house. <laughs> that's that's well, not the chair. That's my back. <laughs> the um, this and of course everything I'm saying is just just my opinion. You yeah. Know, this, but I know. Do you want a disclaimer? Yeah. I just want this is a disclaimer. I'm giving it to you. But I noticed with Tom Hanks that his career changed some when he did the movie Punchline, mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily a great movie, mm -hmm. okay? But it takes place in the world of stand-up. And he and Sally Fields were each given the opportunity to learn to do stand-up. And they were each assigned a comic. Uh, uh, she had Susie Essman, who went on to fame and fortune with Curb Your Enthusiasm. And he had a guy named Barry Sobel, a wonderful guy. and they were both given carte blanche at the clubs mm. to, to, to develop and they could go up anytime they wanted. Mm -hmm. And Sally Fields did it once mm -hmm. and it was such a horrible, terrifying experience. She never did it again. So when you watch her in the movie, she is an actor acting what she thinks is the, 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 the stand-up experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Almost to, to some extent, not quite the same, but as Mrs. Maisel. Right. When you watch Mrs. Maisel, it's like it's not really stand up. Right. It's, it's almost like a song in a in mm -hmm. in, um, in a musical. It's meant to to uh, um, to move the story forward. There's other things going on other than just the humor. But Tom Hanks actually learned. He went up. He sucked it up. He had you know he bombed. He had different problems. But over the course of about two months, he learned how to do a stand up. Said he can go up, hold it, hold hold his own for ten or fifteen minutes in front of an audience. And what happened was I noticed that on his talk show appearances, it shifted after that because all of his appearances on Letterman, on The Tonight Show, whatever show it is, he's firing out lines. Yeah. He's firing out lines. Right. And boy, nothing makes the audience sit up, take notice, and take you seriously than generating that kind of response. And um, that was just an, an observation I made about him. I like that though because I, I know when I'm interviewing people on the podcast, for instance, if they bring some humor, I'm so grateful. 
I'm so grateful. You can feel the air change in the room and you can just feel the audience getting a bit more engaged. So it's terrific advice to have this on you. If you're going to be, if you're a writer who is going to be interviewed for your work, either for your body of your work or for, on a podcast or for an essay you've written or whatever, you know, just to, to have that, that, that lightness, that sense of humor in there. And plus, go back and look, well, you know, I, on YouTube, I watch the old Dick Cavett show. Right. And you get the sense of what interviews were like 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And you occasionally smile. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And he was once being interviewed by, he was once on The Tonight Show. And uh, Johnny Carson said something and then he responded and he says, and he tried to say it again and he goes, because there's a joke in here someplace. And Johnny Carson says, yes, but we don't have the time to find it. Okay? <laughs> Is that his his thing about being droll, right? okay, was fine back then, but right. now they want to pay off. Right. And I think it can help you selling what you're doing if you can do that when you're when you're when you're presenting your product to people. Absolutely. Good. Those are so those are uh, some ways right. you can use some jokes. So let's sort of if, for those people who think that they have material that is funny and they might want to put it in a performance space. They they might want to put it on a page, they might want to put it in a performance space. They might want to do all of those things. First, you've got to write it anyway. So let's try to here discern the difference between storytelling and stand up. So how do you define the difference? Well, this and once again, this is just me. This is right. me saying well, you're my it expert. All, it all comes down to narrative. Mm -hmm. And what is the importance of the narrative? Mm -hmm. When you listen to a moth uh, performance, okay, right. the narrative is at the core of it. Right. You know, telling that story is so important. And there's wit that happens around it, and you get some laughs and stuff like that. But ultimately, the laughs, the jokes, I think are meant to make it so you can you can endure the story sometimes. Mm -hmm. I told you the story of a guy, he, uh, his wife had passed away from, I think, breast cancer back in the in the 70s or 80s. And she was an actress and he did a one person show about it. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a, you know, it's a very difficult story to have to tell. Oh. However, there were laughs throughout it. Mm -hmm. That's how you're able to, to, to handle the story. Mm -hmm. You know, they, I, I heard Jack Lemmon once in an interview say the show that had the most laughs in 1949 on Broadway was Streetcar Named Desire. Oh, that, now that's now a surprise. That's a surprise. But to actually listen to it, you realize there's a lot of things in it that are laugh lines, hmm. that they're, you're able to tell it. And the only way you can handle a story that's that, that devastating is with things that have Think about Raging Bull. When mm -hmm. I remember seeing Raging Bull in a movie theater, it's a comic character. He's, mm -hmm. he's getting, there's big laughs going throughout this horribly depressing, right. abusive story. Right. Okay. So that's, that's, for an, uh, that's for a storytelling situation. Right. Um, however, for stand up, the narrative to me is simply a device. It is something that you have that allows you to string jokes on it. I look, I use the example of like a Christmas tree and it's like there's, your story is sort of like the Christmas tree and the jokes are the, uh, uh, are the, are the decorations the that you're hanging on, yeah. the ornaments. The, the, the story, the, the uh, narrative provides a backbone for your jokes. Right. And that's the bulk of what I do is that. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect um, sense. I have one story uh, um, about, a snow day. Hmm? Oh, we're okay. gonna. I'm gonna ask you to tell okay, it in a minute. Okay, okay. Yeah, you gotta hold on. I got a slide for that, sure. Russ. Yeah, I've got a slide. Nice slide for that. So you, when we talk, started talking about make, continuing this discernment, just so people really understand the difference. Um, you said, are you writing to be read or are you writing to be said? So yeah, that's something in my class. I taught a class in New York mm -hmm. for about three and a half years before COVID hit, and. Um, uh, and that was a line I came up with. The question is because people write things and then they try and present it as a, in a live performance situation, it just falls flat because right. it sounds so wordy. Stand up uh, is, is it's almost like a different language. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's 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 a different because you do, you're getting images out there. They don't have to be complete sentences. You know, they just they just have to be. You got to get the information out in the proper order mm -hmm. and if you're actually writing sentences, it's it's a bit much. Yeah, you know, nobody really actually speaks in complete sentences. And I say that to people when they're writing dialogue all the time in memoir. Nobody actually says, hi, Ross, 
I met you because you're with my friend Gwen, who I've known since 1992, when she and we don't speak like that. We speak, hey, yo, how you doing? Good, nice, see ya. And that's a conversation. So I think of joke telling too as having that sort of choppier affect. So you also gave me a really good example of Stephen Sondheim, and I and I read this interview too, where he was asked if his lyrics were poetry. And what it was even more than that, someone referred to his lyrics as poetry. Oh, that's right. And he was he he uh, he pulled back and he says, "No, my 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 songs are not poetry. Right? Poetry is something that you can that you can that you can read it, and you can think about it, and you can ponder it. You can go back, you can reread it, you can look at that word, you can take that word in, you put these two things next to each other, and you can really absorb it. A, a, a song, a, a Broadway song like that." line comes out it hits the audience and it either hits or it doesn't and but they're on to the next line they don't have time to go back and think about it right okay um and that's the way stand-up is mm -hmm. this is not meant to be absorbed slowly over time it's meant to be absorbed quickly and then you're on to something else right and so it's the same between memoir writing and writing jokes for stand-up. With with memoir, reader can go back and read it and absorb it, but with stand-up, it's got to stand alone. And then, as you said, you're onto something else. Right. So this starts to pull these two these two genres of storytelling apart. So we talked a little bit about how the narrative is just a device to hang the jokes on, but you're and and you mentioned too that the audience is there expecting jokes. That's so, what they're paying for. Well, yeah. That's what they're there for. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's not like it's it's not like an extra thing they get. Right, and if they get narrative, yeah. nice. That's what um, they, it's like a side right. dish, but they want the laughs. Right. Okay. And uh, you sort of start with that. <laughs> I I was taking an acting class because I, you know, every every comic thinks they can act, you know, and I'm finding out I, I can't. But uh, I was taking this class, and the guy was someone was referring to stand up like acting. And I don't think it is. I think it's a it's a it's a it's a more specific skill. I compare stand up to play to bowling, <laughs> whereas acting I compare more to golf. And you're going to have to explain that. Well, golf, you know, you got you got what 15 clubs, 14 clubs. You have all these different ways to swing them. You have, you have many many different tools. Mm -hmm. And you know you got you're having little chip shots. You're having you know big drives. There's all this stuff going. Stand up. You're pretty much taking a ball and hurling it down an alley to try and knock all the pins down every time. I see. Okay. Hi, it works for me. And I it. mind you, there are nuances within it, mm -hmm. but still, it's a rather narrow uh, thing that you're that you're shooting the ball down. Right. It's a lane. And got the, it. and the goal is always the same to knock those things down. Right. So that's that's how I look at it. And know? it would be exhausting to write like that every sentence. It would be exhausting on a page. Right. right. Be, if, 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 to if, read. if the intention was to have it be read. Right. If, if, okay. and, and the reader can't take it either. That's why most comedians who write books of their material, mm -hmm. it's mainly kept in the bathroom mm -hmm. because you can handle it for about a minute or two. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. That's right. funny. OK. You know, and then you can you can put it down. And you can move on. Right. Because you're not right. Because it isn't linked by narrative. I get that. Right. That's interesting. And I love the distinction. So. Why don't you just go over for us a little bit about what you actually do? You know, you, we talked about this a bit and what what does a comedian do and, and what how what is the link to personal experience? Because I still think that a lot of memoir writers think, yeah, but I could just get up and tell my life story and it would be hilarious. And maybe not so much. The, um, uh, it's funny, I was thinking on, on the Letterman show years ago, but um, and I think it was Tom Poston was on and he was getting ready to go to Atlantic City to perform. Uh, and, and Letterman said, well, uh, oh, so, you, so you've done Santa Fe? He goes, no, no, but I've got some stories I want to tell and stuff like yeah. this. And, uh, and, and you could just see Letterman just shake his head. You know, kind of like you say, he said, like, good luck with that. Yeah, you know what I'm yeah right. Good luck. Because you. you think you can do it. Right. But it's a skill in and of itself, all by itself. And, and it takes a lot of time to, you got to suck for a long time. Right. To get so you can actually do it and yet we're drawing from our life stories so yes so we're going to get to that so so talk about your life your comedy and your personal okay. experience this, this is what i think is that what what we do what i do what my real job is mm -hmm. is i go through my life and i look for things that i think are funny mm -hmm. and things that make me just something that makes me smile mm -hmm. okay 
And then I got to figure out a way to communicate that moment to a group of people and to get them to all see what I thought was funny at the exact same moment. Oh, at the exact same moment. Okay, Absolutely. I get that's it. Like yes. you're, you're cracking a whip. You got to get them, bang, you got to you gotta get them at that moment. Right. And um, uh, that, um, let me think. So, uh, and that's what I'm, I'm, when I was teaching my class. Right. I was having them start. I would tell them to go take a, take a notepad, mm -hmm. go to your life. This was the assignment. Mm -hmm. And three times, I want you to find three a day, three a day, things that make you smile. Mm -hmm. And then at night, don't try and make a joke out of it then. Mm -hmm. That night, sit down and take a half an hour and try and figure out a way to turn these things that you thought were funny into actual jokes. Mm -hmm. Things that have an ironic twist mm -hmm. at some point and that cracks at the end with a punchline. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then that becomes, you know, that's why, you know, Seinfeld, for heaven's sakes, was at the beginning of his career, he was writing four or five hours a day. Yeah. He was like that focused on, you know, and that and that specific kind of writing, mm -hmm. trying to acquire those those uh, uh, those jokes. So you say you told me when we were talking, if you base what you're doing on personal experience, you have something invested in it emotionally. So so, so get get into that. I've been working for uh, uh, over 40 years. Mm -hmm. I left the army. I was at, I was a cadet at West Point, and I resigned halfway through my second year to do this. I just I got the I got the bug. It's a career change. It was, it was uh, you know I saw Saturday Night Live, and that was it. And oh, I was hooked. I love it. And um, and I wasn't the only one. I mean, there's. It, you know, the, the stand-up comedy explosion that started in the 70s and happened subsequent to that, it was the, it was our gold rush. Right. You know, the number of guys who were, at, you know, and, and ladies who were coming out to L.A. To, to try and make this thing happen in the late 70s, early 80s. It was just an onslaught and it's still there. It's, it's um, but, so, um, I left the academy and um, uh, I, I worked on my act and I had an act, I made a living. And 20 something, but I, I went to LA and I'd never done New York and, and I've been doing it for 25 years. And in 2000, I sort of this, I then spent a lot of time over in England performing and I decided to try and give the US another crack mm -hmm. to try and get to the next level. I wanted to do, well, actually, I wanted to do letter, that's what I wanted mm -hmm. to do. And so what happens is I come to New York and, you know, leave my ego at the, at the George Washington Bridge and I try and start over again. Mm -hmm. And I auditioned at a club uh in the city called the comic strip mm -hmm. and there was a guy who was the curator the the uh, creative director lucian hold and i went up i and, and there was and the uh, business was horrible at that particular point mm -hmm. and there was not a lot of people in the audience maybe 15 people the comics were all grumbling but for me it's like 15 people oh boy this is my <laughs> chance this is my big shot you know 15 live people that's right 15 no listen and, and i go up and i do my thing that I, what i thought a new york city set should be mm -hmm. and i had a great set and afterwards lucian just put his arms around me says you got to work here and uh it changed my life mm. okay because, how wonderful and i was there and he died three years later but for those three years he really took me to another level but what he said was if you're going to write, you know, are you going to be able to compete with joke writers mm -hmm. like Stephen Wright, like, you know, Jerry Seinfeld, guys who are master craftsmen mm -hmm. in what they do? And chances are you aren't. And so he always encouraged people to, to draw from their personal life experience, because when you do that, you become alive. Right. Okay. You, if, if you're, if all you're doing is trying to get this this word, these words together to make the joke perfect. Mm -hmm. That's a skill all in and of itself, but you're gonna, uh, most people are gonna come across where, where they're flat. Right. So if you're telling your story, if it comes from something inside of you, all of a sudden you're three dimensional. And that's it. You know? And we've noted, we've seen that. We've, we've all seen that when somebody- And you probably find it with writers, they always say, write what you know. Right. You know, and and because if you don't, you just you're just making things up that right. don't that don't have a lot of they don't have any substance to we it. We don't pay enough attention to explaining that to people what you actually know, and it and it is that dimension. It is what is this deep in your heart? What is this about? Where is the where is this touching? And your of course, that's self? what memoir, absolutely, is, absolutely is writing ultimately about what you know. Right, absolutely. My inner story, the pain that I have, 
<laughs> that I'm convinced you need to know about. Well, you absolutely need to know for 365 days. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of a joke yes. because jokes have structure. So you told me this Jerry Seinfeld story. And so I put it up here so people can read it. But how about you just give us your version of well, this? Well, I read this article and it's, this is the best example of joke structure. Right. And, and, and Jerry said it so perfectly. Uh, David Byrne had this one person show on Broadway and he had this joke. He called American Utopia was right. the joke. And he had this joke he closed with. It was, I would say the firemen don't want you to dance in the aisles because the dancers in the aisles have an unfair advantage in the event of a fire. Right. So Jerry, according to the story, had gone to see it with Amy Schumer. Mm -hmm. And now if I went up and told something to David Byrne, this needs to be done this way. It's like, you know, get out of here, kid. You know, it's 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 not gonna have any credence. But when Jerry Seinfeld says it, you, you sit in and you listen. And he said that you've gotta put the unfair advantage. The, you look at this thing, an unfair advantage is what it has to end on. That's the joke. That's the punchline. That's the punchline. You don't wanna have a bunch of stuff after, you don't wanna have anything after that because the people will get lost. They're, right. they're, they're, you you wanna have it all lead up to unfair advantage. So the way it should read, is the firemen don't want you to dance in the aisles because, because in, the event, of in a, the event of a fire, the dancers in the aisles have an unfair advantage. Absolutely. And that's the structure it needs. Then you, then you can shut up and the punchline works for you. And all the irony that he's presented before then just kind of all boom, it just hits them all at once and you have a joke. So you stick the landing. Right. Yep. yep. Right. So, so the phrase unfair advantage comes at the end and you can feel that when you think it through. And when people look at these slides later, they can see this because I put it up on the slides and you can read it. And I see that, I teach this in memoir all the time is how you end a sentence can be terribly, terribly important in terms of the delivery. If it creates a funnel and you give us some information and then it lands in this very small place, we get to metabolize the message of all of that language much better. So I think it's it's a writing skill, absolutely. I would like to see what would happen if Faulkner had taken your class. <laughs> <laughs> we would have gone for drinks. <laughs> so you've got a couple of stories that you you offered to tell. Well, I mean, this, this is this is probably the, the the ultimate example of taking something from my personal life and turning it um, uh, turning it into a joke. Right. Uh, and I saw you perform this, and yeah, I laughed out loud. Because, absolutely. Uh, the joke, and I'll tell you the joke. The Great. joke is uh, I've been married twice. I was widowed by my first wife. I was divorced by my second wife, or as I sometimes say, my first wife died and my second wife wouldn't. Okay. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, it's it, it it comes from a long tradition of guys hating their wives and all those kind of jokes and right. stuff like that. That are still funny. Uh, the, huh? That are oh, yeah, still the, funny. If they're structural, if, if they're structural and they work. Yeah. You know, these days I've been well. I'll, I just did a, a show, a Valentine's show for 1,200, 600 couples. And uh, I did a number of jokes about couples not getting along. Mm -hmm. And uh, I put it in the context of why do, why do we still find these funny? Right. You know, what is it? And I has to, and I think it has something to do with just the, the, the juice that happens between people. You've got, there, there's the, sometimes you don't like, you, you have, you, you love a person and there's things about them you don't like. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so anyway, that's the joke. Now in my personal life, uh, my wife, my first wife uh, had breast cancer and she passed away when she was 30 years old. Mm. And um, uh, and then I had, like many men, did not grieve it. You know, this isn't a therapy show, but I didn't really grieve it. I moved, you know, you think you can replace is what you think you can do. Right. Okay. And I, I uh, and so I, I got married again real quick. Mm. And of course it was a horrible, horrible situation. I, I pity the woman. I pity the woman. And um, I didn't really grieve my first wife until the second wife uh, and I have got, had gotten divorced. And I chewed on this for so much time. It took me years. And all of a sudden in my mind, it just came it just came out, mm -hmm. you know, my first wife died and my second wife wouldn't. And that's also a great example of what you're looking for in terms of an ironic twist. Right. You know, because I think we bring it up later, but you know, the irony is really the thing that you are not, not expecting. Your, your mind, does your mind see it coming? No, it doesn't. And it's surprised, it's tricked. Right. 
and uh, everything there is exactly like you might find in a regular story. You know, you know, what did my first wife divorce my second wife? My first wife died. All of that is just like a drama, right? And then the twist, the thing you aren't expecting, is the nasty undertone of and my second wife went. Yeah. And then I that gives that lapse gives me enough time to take a drink of water. It but there were big laughs that, that night yeah, that yeah. I saw that. Well, I'm a, I'm a professional. So. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's why we are here tonight. So you've got a story too. Perhaps you would be willing to well, show us your story. I won't tell the whole thing, but the thing is, is is I years this, this you have to understand I've been doing this routine probably for 35 years mm -hmm. okay and I made a lot of money off it because it 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 warms people's hearts I do a lot of nostalgic kind of things in my act and but this is it draws from my personal experience and yet the story is really just the the uh, device that I hang the jokes on mm -hmm. so I'll just start it out it's uh, I grew up believing in God because we had a thing called a snow day, a gift from God. A, a day there's so much snow on the ground, they have to cancel school. A gift from God. <laughs> and um, I remember it, 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 I would wake up on, on, and I'd look out my bedroom window, and I'd see snow piled halfway up the window. And I'd say, there's a very good chance I'll not be going to school today because my bedroom was on the second floor of the house. <laughs> okay? So this is, that's all true. Right. And then a twist. I've, I've talked this about this in my class before. A lot of time what comics actually are doing is they say something serious, then they make some sort of a, a snarky comment, and then they do it again, and 45 minutes go by and they give them a check. Yeah. Okay? The question is how much how much juice can you give it mm -hmm. uh, that, that people, you know, can, 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 can find it interesting. So uh, um, I can go on and do more like the, the, uh, from it, but the point was that every element of it is – from my personal story. You go downstairs, listen to the radio. That's where they announce the schools that are canceled. Mm -hmm. and, um, and my mother would give me cinnamon toast, toast, butter, sugar, and cinnamon, the four basic brew groups on nine square inches, okay? <laughs> it's a cinnamon toast joke, but wow. it starts off with a cinnamon toast fact. I had cinnamon toast. It's amazing I'm alive today. <laughs> I had so much butter and sugar as a child. Okay? And cinnamon, well, it was and, cinnamon and that saved cinnamon, you. I think so, yeah. I believe so. Me too. Um, and they'd announce my school canceled, and I'd question if my mother loved me, because it's 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 the it's the worst day of the year. It's a blizzard, yeah. and she wants me to go outside and play. In a blizzard, she stuck me in my snowsuit, sent me out the side to play. She'd take a scarf, and she'd wrap a scarf around my face like she was going to pull start the lawnmower. <laughs> okay, and of course, and, and now requires an audience right. who remembers that there were there were lawnmowers you had to pull start. <laughs> right. But I'll, I'll continue with the story. But the point was, every element of the story, this, but I, I end up going through and explaining the things you would do as a child on a snowy day. The, the, uh, 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 toboggan sleds and flying saucers. Mm. Toboggans for large families that couldn't afford a sled for everyone. A 15-foot long strip of varnished wood upon which you can pile three or four generations of a family and allow them to hurtle together to certain death, singing the old traditional tobogganing song. If you know it, join with me tonight. Oh. <laughs> Once again, everything is a serious comment that's a true thing, right. and then a smart ass comment about it. And then, then I'm, the, the joke I'll leave, leave you with here is that we lost a lot of good Catholic families that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and now I got I got a couple of jokes about Catholic families. Sure, but the uh, the point was, the story is not what's important. Now they love the story, right? They love feeling it, but it's not really a story that's that's important. Ultimately, it's all the jokes about your childhood and winter and, and that experience. Yes, I get it. That's wonderful, and that just shows you how to build it and how it is different instead and absolutely different than writing a straight piece of memoir positively. So you talked about irony and you know and you say that the heart of humor is irony and, they, and you say you can't teach somebody to be funny but how about just give us a sense of of this idea well, of irony. First off that they they, they you, I've often heard people, comics say you can't teach someone to be funny. You're either funny and that's and I got to tell you I've had a lot of students who, who just aren't funny, mm -hmm. you know. But I I do try and teach them what funny is mm -hmm. 
because they don't get it. A lot of people don't, they don't get it. Right. They just want to be it. Huh? They just want to be it. But you know, and, they, and then they, they're telling these stories and it's like, you're going, you're, you're just looking at your watch. You know, yeah. I, got, I got, I, you know, I got places to be. It's like, yeah. it's like Johnny Carson, maybe a joke here someplace. We, we don't have time to find it, but I try and make them see that the, the irony is like, like when the things I understood for you, you're going down this road. It's a rather straight road where you know where it's going. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you make a quick right hand turn into the woods yeah. that you're not expecting. Right. And that's ultimately what irony is. And it can be, it can be in many forms. It can be in terms of subject matter, but it can also be in terms of tone. Mm -hmm. It can be turned, you know, in terms of, uh, it can be a happy and all of a sudden you, it can be a happy story and all of a sudden you have a nasty attitude towards it. And it, and it, and it gives it that twist. Mm -hmm. now, I got a friend, um, Darren Streblow, very funny guy. And he was talking about, he looked at it like a ditch, mm. okay? That a joke is, it's like a ditch and it, it can't be too wide. You're, you're coming up, you're leaping over this ditch. It can't be too wide because that's when the audience goes, I don't get it. Yeah. You know, and it can't be too narrow because that's when you go, oh, I saw that one coming. Right. So the question is, how do I get this thing to be just the right width? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there was a, 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 I was reading a, actually, you know, some sort of a, a neuropsychologist kind of a person, but he said, what it's all about is, did your mind see it coming? Mm. And that's the challenge when, you, when you're putting these things together, is is it a surprise to the audience? And because you're actually, you're tricking the mind, that's where laughter comes from, mm -hmm. is you're tricking the mind. It's beautiful, I get that totally. And I love the idea of the ditch of, at a certain width. That makes perfect sense to me, absolutely. So what, can memoir writers be stand-up comics? Yes. However, I, I you, you just can't kid yourself that it's something that you can just, it takes a lot of time to, to put those skills together. It's a skill. You know, I'm learning to play the piano right now. How's that going? It's been three months. I can listen to it <laughs> because I can enjoy the parts that, oh, I recognize that. Right. Okay. But anybody else in the room, you know, not, not so they're much. willing to give up state secrets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just to get me to stop. Okay, and that's three months. Right. Of, you know, I'm practicing and I'm doing it every day and everything. God bless. You. So it probably takes probably a couple three years to actually get so something actually sounds that you want somebody else to to actually listen to. Probably the same way with stand up. The best thing is is if somebody's really interested in it, wherever you happen to be, look up for a local class on stand up. Right. You know, and mm -hmm. and there's be a beginning class. They'll give you like six or eight. Uh, lessons mm -hmm. and they usually have a, a show at the end mm -hmm. where you can bring your family and everything it can be a great experience and you will put together skills just that experience if you can learn how to just take up if you can get that feeling of one time telling a joke and making a group of people laugh mm -hmm. it'll stick with you for the rest it'll of stick life. with you forever right and and that's ultimately what you're trying to duplicate just in conversation mm -hmm. in interview and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. i think it's a great thing to remember i i got stuck on a book years ago that was a very hard book to write. I was writing this, this book on the on the history of red hair, but it had so many different subtopics within it that I just blew up. And I went and I took a course, I took a, a the Summer Writing Institute up at, at Skidmore, at the New York State Writers Institute. I took a fiction writing course and it just blew the back of my head off. And I came home, I finished the book and all was good. So I think that these sort of cross, you know, crossing over into a different genre, crossing over into a performance space, those kinds of things can be incredibly gratifying for writers to just try something different. It loosens up something, at least it did for me. Yeah. So they can, they, you have a technique, you do a lot of coaching um, and you say once, you know, you, you try to find a joke within it. You said before you, you know, you work with people and once you have it, it's a matter of how you shape it and make it structurally sound. So I'm, we're going to take questions in just a minute. But I did want to say that if you're interested in working with Ross, you can. You First of all, you can buy his CDs um, on iTunes under the name Ross Bennett. Second, there's live class on March 15th. It's in, in Saratoga, New York, the Comedy Works, and there's the URL. And for his coaching, which he does do, because as I said, I want to introduce you to these people. Um, and so I'm going to put his coaching URL up in the chat. It's there now, standupcomedycoaching.com slash contact Ross. So if you want to contact Ross and work with him, you work with people one-on-one? -on -one? I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. That's what I do. I mean, yeah. I, I, I talked for three years. Then COVID hit. I taught for like a year and a half online. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I moved up here. So I no longer can uh, move up in the Troy area. Mm -hmm. So I can no longer teach in the city. So mm -hmm. I, that gig I uh, 
Somebody else is teaching that now. Uh, but uh, I'm teaching at this at uh, in Saratoga at the Comedy Works. Mm -hmm. And one on one, what I do is I I can help with skills and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But what I really like to do is I like to work with you on your material. Yeah. You know, I, I, I like to sit there face to face and like to go through and I like to have you read me your material. Because mm -hmm. what a lot of it is just translating it into stand. -up. But face to face can be online, can be. Can yeah, be yeah, Zoom. I, I do. I, I, I'm Zoom. a Zoomer. I'm a Zoomer. You're a Zoomer. I'm a Zoomer. You're a boomer, you're a Zoomer. What can I say? I'm a baby Zoomer. You're a baby Zoomer. Okay, so if you want to work with Ross, here's how to do it. And here's also um, the contact for the CDs again and the contact for the live class in Saratoga. And what we're going to do now, if we can get the slides, and here you can go to rossbennett.com. Your website is beautiful, by the way. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's really nicely done, which I really appreciate. I had rossbennett.net. Oh. But I kept looking for, this is like 15 years ago. Yeah. Somebody else, a plumber, yeah. had rossbennett.com. And one time I looked at rossbennett.com and it was available. And you jumped on I it. jumped on that so quickly. Yeah, I bet you did. And uh, bought it for 20 years. Yeah, good. All right. Well, let's do this. Let's get um, qu the questions. We can get some questions up in the. Uh, I'm going to read the questions aloud. You won't be able to see them, um, but I can see them. So I'll read them to you, Ross. Sure. Don't worry. Um, so, so Se Quinn says, I find that that I laugh just when I'm primed to laugh, and then I laugh just when something's true is said. Like recently, I laughed out loud at something that wasn't funny. But Steve said to Miranda while eating ice cream, that chia seeds get stuck in your teeth. I wanted Steve to have a moment, and it was perfect to his character. Oh, we're talking about in Sex and the City. As a new writer, I realized it wasn't funny at all, but I needed it from Steve at that moment. So sometimes we need the humor in a piece. Right. You. you well, yeah, you, you'll you find that particularly with stand-up, you reach a certain point. They need it there. Right. They need that laugh there. You, you're obligated to do it. Mm -hmm. um, there's some guys who've done some rather daring things. Uh, uh, Leary, Leary, Dennis Leary, uh, in his Cure for Cancer, mm -hmm. it's this you know, hard-hitting stand-up, bang, 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 bang. And then all of a sudden, for like three minutes, he goes into this horribly depressing story. Mm. And the lights change and everything, but he's, he's showcasing his acting is what he's doing. Right. And it brings you in, and then he comes back out of it. But that's the exception to the rule. Right. Absolutely. So I love that actually, um, S.E. Quinn. I love that the idea that you sometimes we just need that laugh and it and it works there. Um, and I just I, how to make something true get a laugh is a really wonderful. Well, we talked about that in terms of landing right. landing the joke where it needs to land. Um, Mike Welch says, well, I'll stop reading the last names. I probably shouldn't do that. Mike says the joke works because there is no repetition. Oh, so your first, if you started with my first wife died and repeated it, it would not have worked. Right. So it works because and that that ditch we have right. to jump over. That's a it's a perfect wit. I remember that at your show in Saratoga. And I literally I felt like I was almost laughing. It came from a place I didn't even think I didn't have time to process it. I just howled. And we were all in masks that night. And we and we what we what I do is you know, I'm around the so many young comics. They've been trying to put together all this new. They got think they got to put all this new stuff together. They got to be doing new stuff all the time. No, my act is is my baby, right? You know, and I and, and anytime I can find something new to put into it, I want it. But we, my skill is I go up and I tell you stuff that I put together over the past 35, 40 years, mm -hmm. and you think it's happening for the very first time. Right. It's a lovely feeling, you know. And also just having had the great advantage of having dinner with you and talking with you, this is not that you're pummeling us all the time with your humor. Like I've had conversations with you that are not fun, but there's like you're a regular person who then goes home and works hard. Some people are surprised at that. <laughs> I, I have found that, 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 that over the years, particularly back in my 30s or so, I, there was a point where I just had to say, okay, I got to keep this up there. Right. Okay. That's what I want to talk about. Uh, yeah. And I used that for the for years, I, went, I didn't wear glasses. I wear glasses because I pretended I was Superman. Oh. When they were, How'd when that they, go when, for you? When, when, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ross Bennett. Yeah. And it's like I'm wearing glasses and it's like I'm Clark Kent. And then when they say that, I take those glasses off. I'm up there, right? And it's like I can be this different energy. Oh, because I found that I couldn't handle everybody. Yeah, I couldn't be Milton Berle. Mm. I couldn't have everybody thinking I was the most obnoxious person in the room. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I just couldn't handle it. Yeah, I understand that. Well, but I what I love is that you you work on this and you perform it, but in your day to day life, you're you're a different person, or you're this. Well, you comics don't really laugh a lot. 
Mm. What comics do is, is not. When a comic, the best compliment you can get from a comic, that's funny. Oh, oh yeah, I would kill for that. That's funny. That's, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Thank you, Essie, for the compliment about my podcast, Cordy. That's very, very kind of you. Um, Janet says, I don't have a question, but I want to thank Ross for making me laugh out loud so much. I love the old people make noise bit among many more. Thank you. Oh, that's lovely. So Mike says, is, is it some, somewhat instinctual? Can repetition, can, for instance, repetition can be the joke or ruin the joke. So what's the instinct here, do you think? What do you mean repetition? Well, he's asking, is it somewhat instinctual how you how you get the timing of a joke? And and I mean, you talked about the hard work writing four or five hours a day. So. Yeah, I was lucky enough to, you know, I, there was a lot of I was able to get a lot of stage time. I worked for free at the beginning for mm -hmm. years, but I got I was able to get up a lot and I got so I, you do have that sense that that they need something here, you know, that, 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 ah. you're, that you're 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 feeding them spoon feeding. You're not you don't have a ladle. Right. She's spoon feeding. Okay, no, ladle, you know? no ladles here. No ladles. Um, so I would say, in some regards, it is instinctual. Mm -hmm. And for some people, they have to. You have to learn that. Well, I mean, watch. I'm telling you, watch an interview with Tom Hanks. Mm -hmm. That's the best example you have of somebody who can just, ma you know, sit there masterfully handle a group of people, get information across, important mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm and have them laughing while he's doing it. Mm. Yeah, it's good training. I think you can study it. I do think, I think you can study the the writing. I think you can work on writing technique and work on writing every day is one of the messages when, you're when getting. When I work with my students, the writing we do, they, they come to me, I work with a lady today, wonderful, she's Brazilian and she's a, a, a nanny. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's got this wonderful material about what, the, what, what, her exper what her experience is like, but it's written. Mm -hmm. It sounds red. And so our big thing is trying to tr make it so it, it can be said. Right. And I tell her, I said, there's no guarantee these are even going to work, mm -hmm. but we're at least giving you bullets for your gun. <laughs> you know, we got to, we got to get, you've got to, you've got to get these. It's like, a, it's like a, an airplane. You've got to get it at least so it can be taken up and it has a chance of flying mm -hmm. on a test flight. Sure. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Larry asks, how do you know what's funny to others when it may be funny to you? Where can you find a sounding board? So that's what you'd be as good sounding, but you're a good coach. Yeah, right? but, but but I mean, ultimately, the audience is the final arbiter. So you just get up there and you try it. And yeah, and uh, and so that's why so many comics talk for about years of just eating it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Renata asks, where's Ross's email? So I put it up in the chat. Can can you guys just tell me if you can see that in the chat? Standupcomedycoaching.com slash contact hyphen Ross. So let me know. Can can somebody just tell me if you can see that in the chat, please? If they click on the link on the stand-up comedy coaching mm -hmm. uh, that says contact me. Yes, you can see it'll, it. It'll, it'll pop up. Okay, there, no, they're, they're seeing it. It's right there in the chat, but the, okay. Larry and Vera are saying they can see it. That's Good. great. Thanks, Larry. So, so get it there. Um, that seems to be, Jill asks, there seems to be a technique where comedians read jokes off index cards. I saw this yeah, in the Marvel. That's, that's, what, that's not a technique. That's Janine Garofalo. Oh. The, there was, and I don't, and I, and I say that uh, uh, not disparagingly, mm -hmm. there was a rift in the world of stand-up comedy, probably about 25 years ago, to what they call alternative comedy, okay? And, and so I'm really line oriented, okay? Yep. But you had these comics come along, like Janine Garofalo, like David Cross, like Bob Oden, you know, these, these folks, uh, um, the, the, the wonderful guy who, um, he did the voice in Ratatouille. He's, um, uh, I can't think of it, uh, but he's uh, very popular. But these, they went up and, the, and they were they were getting laughs, but there was there was story involved, mm -hmm. more story involved. And a lot of comics disparaged them, oh. okay? Huh. Because they wouldn't just tell a joke. You know, they, they, they wanted to find their laughs a different way. And Janine Garofalo was famous for being up there with her 100 uh, page notebook, you know, and like, is this funny? Is this funny? Is this funny? Um, I, I'm not from that school. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not really, uh, I need to know what it is and I got to be trying to make them. But it is a school. Hit. It is, it's something that, because and, here's, here's uh, Jill saying she's, she's a bit scared of memorizing it. Can I write out my jokes, which are all based on my family and personal life and present them that way? So there are people that do that. Yeah. And 
but ultimately I find that I have to know the joke inside and out mm -hmm. so that if there's any, if my words aren't, I know the places I have to get to. Right. I know the information I have to get out for the setup. Mm -hmm. And until those pieces of information are there, I can't deliver the punchline because mm -hmm. those things are necessary mm -hmm. there. There's a joke I, I, I did on Letterman about the, um, um, he died doing what he loved. Mm -hmm. I won't go through the whole thing, but it was like, uh, it took me years to get the wording right on it, you know? And, and the punchline ends up being, he died doing what he loved. I don't think so. I think he did what he loved until right before he died. Uh, yeah. And then things went horribly wrong. <laughs> Actually, I think he died doing the one thing he hoped was never gonna happen. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Uh, but to get those words in that order, mm -hmm. it was literally years. Well, it's like what the story uh, you told before about Jerry Seinfeld with David right. Byrne. Get, get the thing to land where you need it to land. Yeah, so Liesl asks, do you have a sense of how you process the pain or emotions around bombing or receiving criticism of your comedy? Well, I always use Seinfeld as, as an example. His ego is so solid. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he, and I guess he's always been this way. Lucian knew him early on. So he, was, he was always like that, that when his jokes didn't land, he didn't take it personal. Mm -hmm. It was he was he was angry or frustrated that he didn't have it right. Mm -hmm. Whereas me, I got a psyche like a sieve, you know. <laughs> so I mean, if I'm up there and something doesn't hit, I mean, I really feel that that I'm the worst thing on the face of the earth, you know. And and other comics are somewhere That's in between. Very generous okay. of you to say. Huh? That's very generous of you to admit. The, uh, but it's very, so it's very difficult for me. But that's why, once I get up there and I start getting the laughs. I turn into a different person mm. because it, I, I just get a, a confidence that I don't have through the rest of my life. It's got to be an incredible energy. It is addictive. So it know? is addictive. Oh, of course. Right. Because, you know, as much as it is for the audience and why else do people come out and see it over right. and over again because of the endorphins and everything like that. But to have that level of approval, yeah. to be in that level of control. Don't get that at home. And, and to look like this. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Should we go back to the you know opening saying, picture? You know, you know, like, I don't, I don't, yeah, go back to the opening picture. I don't, I don't walk through my life and have people, uh, uh, you know, following me around like, you know, like, like a movie star or something. Yeah, you know? yeah, but I'll for pause that, it for, for a that second that and go, go that, back to the original picture. Because, you know, I, I, that was a pretty lovely little line you just let off to say, to look like this. So here we go. Just because, you know, it's just such a great face. I think it's a great face. But, it's a know, delightful face. It's a face made for stand-up, right? The, uh, Yes. Yeah. All it's right. The let's kind get of face that when you find someone who likes it, you latch on <laughs> like, like a barnacle, like you like a barnacle. You, you attach yourself. Barnacle is a nice word. You for, attach for yourself humor. to their underside and you do not let go. Ever. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a, a gift to Gwen. She, that's, that's a actually, gift she's, to Gwen. She's the one who's she's nicknamed you Barney. I like. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no, that's wonderful. That's very, oh, that's sweet. Oh, right. that love that. I will not let her go. Yeah. Um, so Christine asks, do you think there can be any humor in anti-racism for a white woman trying to be woke? <laughs> Tough question. You know, what is it again? It, is there any humor in anti-racism for a white woman? Listen, I, you can find it whether or not is you have the skills to do it mm -hmm. okay um i'm myself at this point in my life i don't i don't touch that subject mm -hmm. because i people aren't up there looking for me to be a, a what do you call it, a, a lantern holder for a movement or mm -hmm. anything like that i'm going up there because for 45 minutes they're looking for relief mm -hmm from what is oftentimes a very difficult, you know, life that, mm -hmm. that they may be having. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not real good on heavy subjects. Some some comedians are wonderful with right. them. Right, absolutely. You know, but I'm not. The uh, That's good, that's good advice. Yeah. I did a show uh, maybe 10 years ago, and it was down in uh, New Brunswick, uh, New Jersey, mm -hmm. at the Stress Factory, wonderful club in New Jersey. And I do it, have a great show. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, this man and his son come up. His son's probably in his late teens, early 20s. And they thanked me because his wife, her, his mother, 
was going through the process of, of passing away. Mm -hmm. And so they just, they had to get out. Right. And they thanked me. Mm -hmm. And it's that moment. And, the, and you, have, you have a number of moments like that that you receive burns in my mind what my job is. That's a wonderful answer. Okay. That's a wonderful answer. Okay. So, um, Going for the Chris asks, going for the laugh in memoir writing is often a way to avoid going deep. What is the balance? How to write funny, but also be three dimensional with your reader at the same time. So, in terms of going to for in terms of memoir writing, I believe the balance is to always know what you're writing about. In other words, when I ask you what you're what you're, what are you writing about? What's this piece about? I don't mean the plot. I mean what's the universal. So, are you writing about forgiveness? Are you writing about mercy? Are you writing about how grief is a mute sense of panic? Are you writing about how closure is a myth? So you want to absolutely go deep, but there's gonna be irony in there in, in all of life's experiences. Even in my first book, which chronicled my mother's descent into Alzheimer's disease at 49 years old, there was humor. And I have subsequently written dozens of essays, um, two for NPR and NPR's All Things Considered that are funny, that have her in it as an Alzheimer's patient. Um, one in which her ashes got lost in the mail when she died and showed up in my rural pint-sized post office on Christmas Eve, a month after her death. And so you can, I think if you know what you're writing about, you can still be, that's the way to go deep without going horrible. Yeah, I, I would say that you make it as true as possible and then actual jokes as opposed to, you know, a little bit of humor mm -hmm. is something you would add later. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't, I would never, at least that's the way I, I, a lot of my stories, they would start off um, rather straight. Right. And then I'm just looking for that one thing. Right. And I, I think that is a really good point. What I will do when I'm writing a first draft or something, I will literally write in the margins, Marion, be funny here, because I'll feel the piece starting to sink. And I, you know, my first draft, it'll just have all kinds of exhortations to me, go back and be funny here. So um, just for those of you who asked again how to get in touch with Ross, go to rossbennett.com and then you can find his coaching page, which is a really good thing to do. I think I'm going to sign up for some, some sessions and I'm cognizant of what time it is, so I'll answer a few more questions. Um, so, so Karen says, so often a hilarious joke in a comedy show flies right out of your memory when you go to tell someone else. Is this because it was written to come as a surprise in the moment? Um, it pro I don't know if it was if that was the intention, mm -hmm. but it's I don't know. Maybe you just were drinking. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. How many? I mean, I I I don't remember a lot of things. Yeah, I don't remember. Hear somebody do. Right. Okay? I remember Every once in a while. You there's something that happens. You remember it. Right. Okay. That. Um, uh, Sarah Silverman, mm -hmm. first time I saw her live the, at the Improv in Los Angeles, probably around 95, 96, and she had a joke, it was a really tough day today. And I had to, uh, uh, I had to report my, uh, my boss for sexual harassment. He didn't do anything, I just had to report. Who? Okay, so she does that. Whoa. And I still remember it. Right. Okay, because as tough as that joke is, she had the skills and the ability to be able to tell it. Right. But it was it was heavy enough mm -hmm. that I was able to I, I I remembered it 30 years later. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get it. Absolutely. So um Gwen Cross uh Kibitz is in here and says, Don't worry, he's not always funny. Yeah. Yeah. Barney. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, thanks, Gwen. All right. <laughs> so um like Martina asks, what, what, what about when the subject matter is heavy? Um, you know, drug addiction, grandparents getting saddled, raising grandchildren, bless his little heart, yet his parents are irresponsible. What, what, are the, what, what topics are off limits? She's just spitballing here with some ideas. But, you know, what, 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 what about, what's off topics? Ultimately, off, I, mean, off I, I hate space. to be such a, a whore. Excuse mm -hmm. my language. Mm -hmm. I hate to be such a whore. But ultimately, if they're not buying it, mm -hmm. I'm not telling it. Oh. Okay. Good advice. The uh, I mean, like things like addiction. I, I I have a joke in my act. I stopped drinking in the early '80s when discos were popular. Mm -hmm. Discos helped people of my generation stop drinking. They had carpeting on the floor, mm -hmm. and for sound insulation, 
it had the same carpeting on the walls. Think about it, carpeting on the walls of a bar, how can you tell when you're falling down drunk? Oh, okay? yeah. So it's just a joke, mm -hmm. but it's all based in truth. I've been, mm -hmm. I've been sober for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. 34 years, Altera said it. Yep. I'm going to going to pick a couple more. Sorry if I'm skipping over yours because we've got a whole bunch here, but I really, really want uh, to, uh, um, you know, give you give give a couple of more people a chance. I think Chris is giving you the name Pat Oswald. Maybe that was the Pat Oswald. That's yes. the name of the he's person. One of the, he's just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderfully funny guy. And you watch watch one of his. I'll tell you, you know, if you want to see people, particularly people who fit into the mode of. Um, storytelling mm -hmm. and and memoir look at mike birbiglia mm -hmm. mike birbiglia is a master mm -hmm. absolutely okay? and, his, and his is stand up um his is stand up and uh he's a he's a great Patton oswald's a great one mm -hmm. yeah there's great people out there so we've got keith from new zealand calling in thank you keith that's so wonderful just love to say, give a little shout out to uh, to to uh, Keith in New Zealand. Um, Gwen says, "Oh, Barney," and that's I think that's a little love note to you. And for the rest of you, um, there is just a just no no end of thanks on our end for you coming along tonight. I promised I'd get you out of here in an hour, so I'm going to keep to my word. Okay. And thank you, everybody. Go see Ross at RossBennett.com. I think you will get what you need. Lots and lots of good coaching, right? Lots of, um, here we go. You can go get the CDs at iTunes on under the name Ross they could, Bennett. If they wanted to, they could friend me on Facebook. They could friend, you could friend him on Facebook. You could do that. And then they'll learn more about the classes in Saratoga and, whoops, and the coaching. I don't know why the slides are jumping around, but they do that sometimes. And the coaching. All of you, you this has been recorded. You will receive a recording of it tomorrow in your email box. Thank you for coming to our first night of Let Me Introduce You via the Memoir Project. And um, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm at the Memoir Project at marionroach.com. Thank you, Ross. That was Thank a joy. You, and see you all soon. Good night.